Right then, let's talk steel. But before we get to the fiery furnaces and the clanging machinery, we've got to start with the raw ingredients. Think of it like baking a cake. You need the right stuff before you even think about turning on the oven. First up, we've got iron ore. This stuff is dug straight out of the ground and it's basically rock with a good bit of iron trapped inside. We're after that iron, but we need to separate it from the rest of the rock. Next, we've got coke. Now, this isn't the fizzy drink your parents might have. Coke, in this case, is a type of fuel made from coal. It burns incredibly hot, and that heat is what we use to melt the iron out of the ore. Then there's limestone. This acts like a cleaning agent inside the furnace. It reacts with impurities in the ore, forming a liquid slag that we can easily remove. Finally, we often toss in some scrap steel. Think of this as recycling at its finest. We can melt down old cars, fridges, whatever we can get our hands on and add it to the mix. Now the heart of steelmaking is the blast furnace. Imagine a giant steel cylinder towering over 100 feet tall, lined with heat-resistant brick. This beast is where the magic happens, where we transform those raw materials into molten iron. We start by dumping our mixture of iron ore, coke and limestone into the top of the furnace. Then we blast superheated air into the bottom. This does two things. It makes the coke burn incredibly hot and it forces the heat upwards through the descending charge. As the temperature inside the furnace climbs, incredible things begin to happen. The iron ore under that intense heat starts to melt. The coke we added burns, producing carbon monoxide. This carbon monoxide reacts with the iron oxide in the ore literally stripping the oxygen atoms away from the iron. This process leaves us with pure molten iron, but it's not quite ready yet. It's full of impurities like sulfur and phosphorus. Remember the limestone we added? This is where it comes in. The limestone reacts with those impurities, forming a liquid slag that floats on top of the molten iron. At the bottom of the furnace, we have two tap holes, one for the molten iron, heavy and glowing like the sun, and another for the lighter slag. The iron is channeled off, ready for the next stage of the journey. We've turned rock into liquid metal, and we're just getting started. So, uh, we've got molten iron, fresh from the blast furnace. It's, it's hot, it's heavy, and it's still got a fair bit of carbon in it, making it brittle. To turn this into the versatile material we know as steel, we need to make some adjustments, and that's where the basic oxygen furnace, or BOF, comes into play. Picture a giant steel pot, pear-shaped and lined with heat-resistant bricks. This is the BOF, and it's about to get dramatic. First we pour in our molten iron, then from the top a water-cooled lance descends towards the surface of the molten metal. Now, here comes the action. Through that lance, we blow pure oxygen at supersonic speeds into the iron. The reaction is instant and spectacular. The oxygen reacts violently with the carbon in the iron, burning it off and creating a spectacular display of sparks and flames. This is controlled chaos, though. The amount of oxygen blown in is carefully calculated. We need to remove just the right amount of carbon to achieve the desired steel properties. Too much and the steel becomes brittle. Too little and it's too soft. While the blast furnace and BOF are busy with iron ore, there's another hero in our steelmaking story, the electric arc furnace or EAF. This furnace has a special talent. It can transform scrap steel back into high quality steel, making the whole process wonderfully sustainable. The EAF looks quite different from its blast furnace cousin. It's a, a large, dome-shaped vessel, and instead of fire and fury, it uses the power of electricity. We load the furnace with scrap steel. Old cars, washing machines, you name it. Then, large electrodes are lowered from the roof, nearly touching the scrap metal. Now, hold on to your hats, because things are about to get electric. A massive electrical current flows through the electrodes and arcs across the gap to the scrap metal. This generates an intense heat, enough to melt even the toughest steel. The EAF is a marvel of efficiency and environmental friendliness. It uses less energy than the blast furnace route, and by recycling scrap, we conserve natural resources and reduce mining activities. Section 5, Ladle Metallurgy, Refining the Recipe. Whether the molten steel comes from the BOF or the EAF, it still needs a bit of fine-tuning before it's ready for prime time. That's where ladle metallurgy comes in. Imagine a giant refractory-lined bucket, the ladle, holding tons of liquid steel. 
This isn't just a container, it's a mobile metallurgical workshop. First, we need to remove any lingering impurities. We inject powdered materials into the ladle, which react with unwanted elements like sulfur and phosphorus, pulling them out of the steel. This process is called desulfurization and deoxidation. Next, we adjust the steel's composition to meet specific requirements. Want a stronger steel for construction? Add some manganese. Need a corrosion-resistant alloy for pipelines? Toss in a bit of chromium and nickel. This precise control over the alloying elements is what gives steel its incredible versatility. Section 6, continuous casting, shaping the molten flow. We've cleaned it, we've refined it, and now it's time to give our molten steel a more manageable form. This is where continuous casting comes in. Forget traditional molds. This process is all about continuous flow. Imagine a bottomless mold, open at the top and bottom, constantly moving downwards. We pour the molten steel into this mold from the top. As the mold moves down, the outer layer of the steel starts to solidify against the water-cooled walls. This process continues and what started as a river of molten steel gradually transforms into a solid steel strand emerging from the bottom of the mold. This strand, still red hot, is then cut into manageable lengths, ready for the next stage of its journey. Section 7, hot rolling, forging strength and shape. We've got solid steel now, but it's still in a rough, blocky form. To turn it into useful shapes like sheets, beams and bars, we need to get it back into the heat and apply some serious force. That's where hot rolling comes in. Imagine a set of massive steel rollers spinning relentlessly. We reheat our steel slabs until they're glowing red hot and malleable. Then we feed them through these rollers, squeezing and shaping the steel with incredible pressure. With each pass through the rollers, the steel gets thinner and longer. We can adjust the gap between the rollers to control the final thickness and shape. Want a thick steel plate for a bridge? Fewer passes. Need thin sheets for car bodies? More passes it is. This hot rolling process not only shapes the steel, but it also improves its strength and toughness by refining its internal grain structure. Section 8, fine tuning, cold working and beyond. Our steel has come a long way, but the journey isn't over yet. Depending on its intended use, it might undergo further processing like cold rolling, heat treatment or surface treatment. Cold rolling, as the name suggests, involves rolling the steel at room temperature. This increases its strength and hardness, but also makes it less ductile. Heat treatment involves controlled heating and cooling of the steel to alter its properties. We can make it harder, tougher, or more wear resistant, all by manipulating its internal structure. Finally, surface treatments like galvanizing or painting protect the steel from corrosion and enhance its appearance. Section 9, quality assurance and beyond, delivering steel. Before our steel can be shipped off to build bridges, skyscrapers and cars, it undergoes rigorous quality control checks at every stage of the process. From analyzing the chemical composition of the molten metal to testing the mechanical properties of the final product, nothing is left to chance. Once it gets the seal of approval, the steel is cut, shaped and packaged according to customer specifications. Finally, it's loaded onto trucks and trains, ready to be shipped to all corners of the globe, where it will become the backbone of our modern world. From the fiery depths of the blast furnace to the precision of the rolling mills, the journey of steel is a testament to human ingenuity and our ability to transform raw materials into the building blocks of civilization. So next time you see a towering skyscraper or drive across a suspension bridge, take a moment to appreciate the incredible journey of the steel that made it all possible.